Hey everybody, just a quick thought for you. Uh, since this is the second interview uh, in a row uh, over the last couple of weeks, that is just an audio interview. I have really no pictures um, outside of you know a title card type thing. Please don't bother sitting and watching a, a screen that doesn't change. Listen to the interview, absolutely. Please do so, and please give me feedback. But if you've got other stuff you got to do, if you want to read some other stuff, or if you're a gamer like me who likes to, you know, go and you know play Minecraft while you're listening to interviews or to whatever other video games or things that that help keep you entertained while you're listening to an interview, just do that. Don't waste your time sitting here watching a screen or you know going full screen and watching a title card for a whole twenty some odd minute interview. Don't waste your time for the love of God. Just minimize the window while you're watching the video and carry on with the rest of your life that you're doing. But please listen. <laughs> so, without any further ado, uh, we will start with the show in three, two, one. Hey, everybody, this is Adam Brott of Liberationist Republic High coming to you from the Voluntary Virtues Network. I've got a special guest. Uh, somebody who really takes two, well, one philosophy and uh, one faith and mashes them together in a way that I don't think anybody's ever heard. Um, uh, her name is Lauren. Uh, I was able to get in contact with her through a friend of mine. Uh, so th it's just so interesting. Anarchism, the Muslim faith. How does that work together? And we'll get into that just a little bit, but... Uh, Lauren, tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, you know, tell the internet, tell the world, uh, kind of your backstory. How did you get from uh, whatever faith and statism you were at, you know, day one till, you know, anarchist Muslim? Fire away. Okay, well, thank you for the opportunity to do so. Um, I was raised in a statist home, like 99.99 percent of Americans, and I am a reformed neocon. That's how I would describe myself. Um, I grew up in a Republican family, and I also grew up in as, as an agnostic um, Jew. I never practiced Judaism, but my family was Jewish, and so I identified culturally with them, and it was unusual that my family was Republican. I guess most, at least at that time, most Jewish families tended to be um, Democrat, and um, but it, it never, you know, I always had a problem with the Republicans being pro-war and kind of in your personal business. I always had a problem with the Democrats being, um, you know, in your wallet all the time and wanting to take from producers to give to non-producers. So I had a problem with both parties. And when I, you know, I, I somehow stumbled upon this guy named Harry Brown. He was a libertarian candidate. Um in 96 and 2000 for president, but I'd heard of him before that. But um, you know how they never include anybody but Democrats and Republicans uh, in the debates, but sometimes they'll have a second debate for what they consider, you know, candidates that only lunatics would listen to. <laughs> um, so I heard this Harry Brown and I thought, my God, he's saying everything I believe. You know, he was um, talking about being non-aggressive as, as far as foreign policy. He was talking about not stealing from people who produce to give to people who don't produce. And, and I really liked him. And I started voting. Uh, I voted for him in 96. And in 2000, th this is an embarrassing status moment I had, but in 2000, there was a really tight race between, I think it was uh, George Bush and Al Gore. And um, it was so close, I felt like the Republicans needed my vote, and Bush was the lesser of two evils. And so I went with the lesser of two evils most of the time. I held my nose, and I voted for a lot of Republicans. Um, but on the local level, I usually voted straight libertarian. And um, then recently, in the 2012 election, I was, I was reawakened by Ron Paul, and I realized that voting for the lesser of two evils is still evil. And it kind of did coincide with my conversion, which was, I, I don't remember when I converted, I want to say maybe four years ago um, that I came to Islam. And um, I guess being a Muslim, I, I realized that it is not okay to vote for evil, no matter 
if it's the lesser of two or the greater of two, it doesn't matter. It's still evil. So it kind of all really fell together for me. Yeah, it, that's a that's a great line. I mean, it's very reminiscent of of my neocon uh, Christian background, which you know, I'm still Christian, but uh, you know, having a few questions on on faith on that end. But that's a conversation for another time. I will get to that okay. today. But um, <laughs> yeah, um, so explain to the people who like myself are likely very ignorant of 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 islam and of the the muslim faith uh give us kind of the core tenets uh how it differs from you know maybe your judaism or uh you know mainline christianity you know where's well, the let's... difference there and then uh you know try to expand on that how it works well with anarchy well, the funny thing is, first of all, I, w I would really like to say, you know, never judge Islam by Muslims any more than you would judge Christianity by people who call themselves Christians or Judaism by people who call themselves Jews. Um, you know, because people are human. It, it would be like, you know, I mean, I, and for me, ha having grown up Jewish, I never associated like Nazis or KKK members with Christianity because I know better. I know that that's not what Christianity teaches and blowing people up and, you know, suicide bombers and, and things like that is not what Islam teaches either. But I think certainly Muslims get a bad rap in the media because the only time you'll, you'll hear about Muslims um, is is when they're saying death to America or blowing people up or whatever, and it's definitely not, not what Islam is about. Um, it, it, as far as the difference, I almost feel like it's a continuum. You know, there was Judaism, and it, if if you are a believer, then you believe that God gave the Torah to the Jewish people, gave the gospel to Jesus, who we are very big on Jesus, by the way. Um, and then the Quran, as, as is often called the final Testament. So they're all basically one religion. And the Quran very specifically says that Jews and Christians get their reward too. There is none of what you hear about um, in the media in the Quran that says, Oh, you have to kill people who don't believe like you do. Um, that's all false, and that's that's all. I think a necessary. We're, we're the bo we're the boogeyman, just like the Nazis used the Jews. You know, whenever 1940, whatever it was, to get people riled up so that they would be pro-war. Today, it's it's Muslims. So I, I guess I just have this knack for always being on the on the losing side, <laughs> or, <laughs> or you know, on the, on the side that that is being chosen but i mean i do think that that islam is being used um to promote war and the war machines and um but the quran itself says that the, the way these two things to go go together one of the most important tenets in in the quran is that we must never be aggressors um it says killing one innocent person is the same as destroying the whole world and that we must never be the aggressors on the other hand if if we're hit first you know uh, more power to us is basically my interpretation of of the message from the Quran. Right, so, and obviously with the anarchism, it's really one tenet. Although some people call theirs two, uh, the one tenet of the non-aggression principle, the Quran says that right there. It's, that simple, yes. that plain worded, and it's explicit. You know, it's one of the most explicit things in the Quran is that we must never be ever aggressors or oppressors. And, um, you know, so and, and the other thing that that a lot of people don't realize is, is that the Quran specifically says that there is no compulsion in religion. So when you hear about honor killings because, you know, some girl did, you know, married somebody who she chose herself, what what people are confusing with Islam is the culture. There are some Middle Eastern and Arabic cultures where they are still practicing the things that the Quran was given to them to try to correct. Um, you can't force your kids to pray if they don't want to pray because it says right in the Quran, I, I have a child and I cannot force him to, you know, to practice my belief because it, you know, it says in the Quran, God, God, God guides whom he wills and misguides whom he wills. So I feel like I have been guided to the faith and I think it, it, it really meshes with anarchism and, um, the non-aggressive principles. Right, right. And I'm 
while you're talking, I'm trying, I'm pulling up kind of keywords, the Quran on this, mm-hmm. Quran on that, mm-hmm. and I'm finding really crappy sites for Pro- some of these you know, that I'm wanting. What's going to happen probably when you, when you pull up <laughs> these things, is you're going to get a lot of hate sites. Um, submission.org. Right. If you, if you try submission.org, basically, you know, whether you call yourself a Muslim or whatever, Islam is just monothe monotheism. So is, I believe in one God and he controls everything. That's what Islam is about. That, um, that there is, that there is one God and one only God. So, um, submission. And so the, the real, uh, translation into English for, for Muslim would actually be submitters where we consider ourselves submitters, but did you find submitter.org? Yeah, submission.org. Submission. Yeah, I've got that pulled yeah, up right and now. You might uh, get some better translations and some things out of the Quran. There's also something called Tanzil.net, which will give you some translations of the Quran into English as well. Right. And so, just a second ago, we talked about how you know the Quran basically espouses, well, it does espouse the non aggression principle yep. straight up, almost yep. word for word. Um, how does, uh, at least, your interpretation of of the faith um, deal with corrupt rulers or a government, well, a government in general. Uh, Cause I, I mean, I personally don't know of any, you know, of what the Quran says about government, this, or, you know, how to deal with corrupt that, uh, you know, what's your interpretation? Well, I'm a little conflicted on it, to be honest. Now it, it does say that the rulers are in place, were put in place by God himself or that he has allowed this. And so I do have some issues with that. But there is there is a passage, and, and I'm not good at saying, oh, it was this paragraph and this line. I've gone through the Quran many times, but I don't memorize, you know, where I find something. But it does say, it does say that you should, um, you know, obey your government. And then also it says that um, the lowest depths of hell are for the oppressors. And I do consider our governments to be the oppressors. Um, at, one interesting passage in the Quran says that um, I could have made you one nation. I could have made you all get along, but I didn't. And I don't know the reason for that, but I, I accept the fact that there is a reason that that um, these different nations were brought and that, that there is fighting and there is hatred. Uh, maybe it's part of all of our own personal tests, which, which, which if, if you'll give me an opportunity, speaking of the personal test, your your personal struggle is what a jihad is. So when you hear people on TV right. say jihadists strap on explosives and, you know, go into nursery schools and explode themselves and kill people, that's not what jihad is. <laughs> right. Or at least that's not what it's supposed to be, because for those people, that well, is their jihad, from what, what I understand. It might be their personal jihad, but it's obviously incorrect according to the theology of, right. of the Muslim right, faith. Right, you are right, because we are uh, all molded by our own um, culture, just like you and I grew up in status households, and we're status, or we grew up that way, and we watch TV, which, by the way, I gave up many years ago, and I think it's part of the reason that I'm not quite as brainwashed as some other people, um, because I think, you know, um, I did, when I... I I'm going to date myself here, but back in the uh, late 70s, I was in college studying um, marketing, and they, it, it was a new concept, um, subliminal advertising, how you could get messages to people without them realizing it through print ads, through TV, movies, you know, the little couple millionths of a second image that comes on the screen that the human eye really doesn't detect, but the message gets to you. So this is a technology that's really been going on for a long time. I'm sure they've perfected it by now. You know, I don't watch TV. I don't go to the movies. I'm not being hit. I I don't read, you know, popular magazines and look at the ads and things like that. So I'm a little less affected than, than some people. Right, right. Yeah. So it's it's just one of those beautiful things that when you step away from you know all the all the messages out there, all the propaganda, and uh, from you know basically what what the state is wanting us to believe in. Because I find myself, you know, I watch TV and I play video games and I watch stuff on YouTube all over the place. I find ways to stimulate myself whenever I'm not reading a good book by <laughs> Rothbard. Um, so I you know, I get on Cartoon Network all the time and I see. 
uh, every once in a while, a, an ad will pop in from, uh, you know, my local government about this, that, or the other thing. And I'm just like, really? Come mm-hmm. on. What kind of shenanigans is it this? It makes me wonder sometimes, <laughs> the way ads are targeted, if if there's some device listening to you at all times. Because I listen to, sometimes at work, I'll listen to um, Pandora. And some of the ads that come on... I have to wonder, like, did you hear the conversation I just had 15 minutes ago or even the Google ads? Um, I understand that I might Google a certain thing and then five minutes later I'm getting an ad for it. But sometimes I just talk about it. I say, oh, I wanted to do such and such and I wanted to look up such and such. And the next thing I know, I'm getting an ad for that. It's scary, isn't it? I I was sick of seeing so many ads on Facebook. So what I did was I changed my birth date to say that I'm like 115 years old because I figure there's no way advertisers want to spend their good money advertising to 115 year olds. So (laughs) so you could. That is brilliant. I thought it was too. I really did because I kept getting all these ads for you know. over 50 dating and things like that at first. And I was like, okay, can you look at my profile? And it does say that I'm married. So why are you sending me all this? I always just got sick of seeing these stupid ads and, you know, other things for over 50, like, no, I don't need a hip replacement. And, um, you know, um, no, no dentures, no hearing aids. Really. I'm okay with all. So I just put in 115 and then that really, um, just put that you were born in like 1900 and, um, You'll stop getting the ads. <laughs> well, until the awkward moment where they start giving you ads for coffins. No, I, I don't think they waste any. They don't waste anything at all. <laughs> so. so now I just kind of want to open the floor up to you. Is there any? Uh, is there anything involving anarchism or your Muslim faith or you know, any combinations of the two, or just kind of misconceptions that are out there that you don't think anyone else really, uh, you know, puts out there, or even your own personal struggles with, uh, you know, the Muslim faith and how that interacts with your well, anarchism. I, I do have Just some, I, by the way. I think there are a lot of misconceptions about anarchism and Islam. Um, I think there are probably even more. Well, well, you have the, the misconception that anarchism equals chaos. And, and I'll, I think you got, you guys on this network are going to be better at explaining that than I would, um, how that's not true. But as far as, as far as the Muslim faith, I do think that um, there there is a lot of culture in uh, some predominantly Muslim countries, and um, people just assume that 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 that's Islam acting out when indeed it is, you know, just the the culture of of a country that you know I, I'm not it's not for me to say this one's backward that one's backward or whatever, but. Let me say this, the the Quran, when people say women are uh, oppressed, that really makes me laugh a lot. Um, So I'll give you a couple examples how the Quran, and the Quran, by the way, is supposed to be our single source for Islam, not Hadith, not stories about the prophet. The Quran, it says, "This this is where you get your religion from. This is where you get your guidance from. So for, I'll give you some examples about women. Um, people complain because a, a daughter gets half the share of a son and that, you know, oh, that's so insulting. See how oppressed women are. Well, in Islam, a man is re- financially responsible for his wife, his children, his parents, um, any unmarried sisters that he has. A woman is guaranteed a right to participate fully in life to work um, it, in religion and politics, women are allowed um, everything. And if a woman works, her money is hers alone. She can spend it on her. She can spend it all on shoes. She can give it to her family. She can, you know, go out to eat every day, um, whatever she wants to spend. But she has no um, obligation at all to support her family. That's completely upon the man, which is why she gets a half share. 
So maybe that explains a little. The same with the covering. There's nothing in the Quran that says you have to cover your hair. That is a Middle Eastern tradition um, that is not just Islamic. The Jews did it. The Christians did it, too, back then. If you go look up old pictures of Jews and Christians in the Middle East, you will see that they covered their hair. I personally do not cover my hair. Um, the dress code for women says that we should dress modestly. We should lower the hemline, meaning don't wear short skirts or pants, um, cover your chest, and that's it. That's our dress code. So those are some misconceptions that we have to wear burqas and, you know, you can only see one eye of us and um, that our husbands, you know, are allowed to beat us every night and we have to just be happy with that. Um, as I hope you can tell from talking to me, there are a lot of assertive uh, Muslim women and those who actually follow the Quran um, know that there's nothing oppressive. The women, the women that I know that do choose to dress in, in the, you know, burqas and covering their hair and all, completely do it by choice. It's our choice. We can dress how we want. Right, and that's, uh, you know, it, it comes back to the whole idea of, you know, freedom, even freedom within the market. You've got the marketplace of your own body and your own thoughts, and you're choosing to do X, Y, and Z as opposed to doing the social norm over here. Um, so it's... And and the one thing that I was kind of circulating through my mind while you were talking about the fact that the women get, you know, if they have a job and they're financially stable with their own stuff, they're not, you know, required or don't have any obligation to, you know, send that money or spend that money on anyone else but themselves. Uh, this kind of feeds into uh, what I hear a lot of Stefan Molyneux talking about. You, I assume you're familiar with Stefan Molyneux. Um, cause he talks about uh, how there's the myth of the patriarchy uh, and that in actuality – when it comes to child rearing, when it comes to the foundations of life, there is actually this more so oppressive matriarchy in a roundabout sense. Not saying that, you know, all mothers are complete, uh, well, insert whatever choice words you would want to have here. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm going to try to tone down my, uh, my expletives as much as possible for this interview, make it more family friendly. Uh, but uh, you've got... You know, the, these brutal mothers out there of all faiths uh, and, you know, everybody's saying that the fathers or the, the husbands in, in the Muslim culture are, are oppressive. Well, I don't think they're oppressive. Check but, yourselves. Okay, <laughs> there, is, there is the misconception that women in general are supposed to be submissive to men in general in Islam. That is false. However, the Quran does say, and so does the Old and so does the New Testament, um, that you are supposed to be submissive to your husband. That doesn't mean you're supposed to be his slave. It means that he is supposed to be the head of the family because he has full responsibility for the family. Um, he has responsibility right. for financial, of course, but also spiritual. Um, it's it's his job to try to guide everybody correctly, to teach you know your kids that we don't steal, we don't hurt people. Um, we are very charitable people. We have big um, obligations upon us. Um, that that there are that is one of the tenets of Islam is is charity. And um, so even poor people are you know poor Muslims, and there are many um, are obligated to give a lot to charity. I think I got off track from what you were what you were trying. No, no, you. Yeah, I. You know, I'm following you uh, on this. I, I enjoy uh, seeing your line of thinking. Uh, and, you know, since we're running a little bit low on time as far as for the interview for the network here, um, if there's any Muslims out there who are watching this video for whatever reason, I don't know how I would end up getting to those markets because, uh, yeah, being a, a an anarchist white male, typically Muslims don't watch my videos. Well, uh, but if you had to make a two-minute case for anarchy to, to those Muslims... What would it be? Um, I would say that as a Muslim, we are all told, and Ramadan is coming up, so we are all supposed to be reading the Quran during, during Ramadan, which is our holy month. And if you truly read the Quran with an open mind, it says don't accept what your parents taught you or what some authority has taught you about what Islam is. Read this book and make your own interpretation. It's your obligation as a Muslim to read the Quran, get your guidance from it, and interpret it for yourself. It does talk about being non-aggressive, and there's really no way... I don't know of, of a government that 
that is non-aggressive, and I don't know if one can actually exist. Right, right, now absolutely. Place, I would uh, like so, to give you one oh, place that you could plug your show or maybe get some more information, and again, that would be the Facebook group Muslims for Liberty. I just follow them. You know, I, I seldom participate, but it is a place that you, um, you know, will find, if not anarchist, at least libertarian minded, liberty minded Muslims, because um, there are a lot of us. Right, right. Absolutely. Is there any other uh, organizations or, or anything out there that you want to plug and say, hey, guys, just check this out? You know, even if you don't agree or you don't like it or you choose to, you know, not follow it you know, for the rest of your life, you know, this piece of information or this group uh, will be instrumental in helping you uh, understand uh, yeah, Islam. There, there is there is anything one, out there? Because when I first converted um, and then I was getting some guidance from Muslim people, I almost wanted to convert back because I was like, this is some, if something insults your soul, you should not follow it. And I got a lot of guidance from, I was telling you about that website, submission.org. These are people who are, who the Muslims, some Muslims call us Quranists and say that we're not real Muslims. Um, but submission.org is where you can get unbiased information that just talks about the Quran. And it was, there is a translation from a native Arabic speaker who was also, um, an, uh, who also spoke English very well and was able to do a translation. And a very sad thing is the man who did this translation was killed by a group of Son, um, Sunni Muslims for being, you know, for not following the Hadith or for not following Islam the way that they thought he should. Right, right. And that's, that's just extremely unfortunate uh, whenever anybody, you know, is murdered in an act of senseless violence uh, because he's not towing right, the party line or not part of uh, the three by five card right, of opinion. And there's opinion. nothing more un Islamic than killing an innocent person simply for not agreeing with you. There's nothing more un Islamic because it specifically says never be the aggressor. So, um, you, and there is no compulsion in religion. So, just because you and I may not see eye to eye about, you know, your, your path is different than my path, and that's okay. We can all take our paths as long as we get where we're supposed to be. Right, right. So to wrap up here, uh, you know, thank you, Lauren, uh, for your time. I actually fully intend on, assuming our schedule is working out, you know, over the next, for the rest of our lives, uh, we can knock out a few other interviews. If there's anything you ever want to talk about, just let me know, and I will get my viewers on it right away. Check out Muslims for Liberty and Submission.org if you've got any questions about how, how the Quran or how the Muslim faith uh, can really work with liberty, and especially Muslims for Liberty, because uh, those will be libertarian or anarchist-minded uh, individuals out there. Again, thanks for being on the show. Uh, this is Adam Broad of Liberation Republic, signing off, saying peace and love and liberty.